Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, a real warm welcome to our service this morning. I hope you've all had a, uh, a good week, kept, managed to keep dry and uh, not have to build too many arcs. <laughs> um, just a couple of thanks this morning. Thank you to Jane for our reading and to Howard for our prayers. So uh, thanks to them. Uh, and then following this service, if you're watching it uh, at 10.30, the premiere, um, we'll be hoping to have a um, Zoom coffee morning at 11.30. So the link should have been on your uh, sheets that we sent out. So um, please do um, try and join us, uh, bring your own coffee and biscuits. Um, but we'd love to see you if you could manage that. So that's 11.30 following this service um, this morning. Uh, that's if you're watching it this morning. Um, anyway, um, I think that's all I have to say this morning and I shall hand over to John. And good morning. It is lovely indeed to see you all. Uh, as always, if you have service sheets, please do use them. But if you haven't, it's just lovely to have you with us and please do join in with our time together. So let's just quieten our hearts as we begin. Grace, mercy and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. And we say together, loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we now have our opening hymn, Bless the Lord, O my soul.
Amen. Uh, now we shall just come to our confession. The Son of Righteousness has dawned with healing in his wings. Let us come to the light of Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We confess to you our selfishness and lack of love. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We confess to you our fear and failure in say, sharing our faith. Fill us with your spirit. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our stubbornness and lack of trust. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Almighty God, your Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us new hearts and steadfast wills to walk in your ways and delight in your truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we now go to Jane for our first reading. The reading is taken from the second book of Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfa the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God, he stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Last week, I asked if we had a Joshua, someone whom we could look up to as our role model, someone whose life has greatly influenced us and perhaps still guides us today. You know, and sometimes those who perhaps change our lives are not the ones we would necessarily look for, not the ones we'd necessarily expect to have such a profound effect on us. And such was the case for Naaman. Well, who was this Naaman? Um, Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. We're told that he was a great man. He was highly respected. He was a decorated and valiant soldier. He was the one that everyone looked up to. They put him on a pedestal. They sought to emulate him, to be like him. And then one day, the news that perhaps every soldier dreads came to him and there was no evading the issue. There was no doubt that it was true. Naaman had leprosy. And immediately the implications of that came through to him. It was it was like a death sentence. Suddenly he was a social pariah. Everyone sort of went to the other side of the road because they didn't want to catch what he had. They didn't want to become infected. He might be a great man, but now who was he? Someone to be avoided. Someone who didn't really even want to look at, never mind speak to. For a soldier such as Naaman, where did that leave his life? Soon he would lose the sensitivity in his fingertips. He wouldn't be able to hold his sword. His grip would weaken. And it would, he would fail. If an enemy were to strike him, would he feel the wound? How much more chance of it becoming infected as it wouldn't heal? His fighting days were over. His life was over. His reputation, his career, and there was no cure. In a moment, his world had come crashing down. Now, there was a young Israeli slave girl in his household. She'd been taken captive by raiding bands who had attacked her home, kidnapped her and sold her into slavery. And Naaman's wife had probably spotted her in the local market, sort of chained up, being sold for a small amount of money. You know, good arms, good work from this person. Perhaps she'd taken pity on her. So she'd taken her into her home, given her work to do. She had no friends, she had no family, she had no future, and she had no name. Or at least not a name that anybody used. She's a nobody. I cannot but help think that when she hears about her master, she knows exactly what he's feeling because she too had had a wonderful life. She too had had a family. She too knew people who loved her. She had hopes and dreams. And all that had been shattered on the day that she'd been kidnapped and sold into slavery. So we have two people, one great, one small, one who's achieved much, one whose life has barely begun. But both stories are intertwined and both know loss. And perhaps we might understand this girl if she thinks to herself, well, God has judged my master. It was his men 
after all who took my life away and now God has taken his. We call it poetic justice. But she doesn't think like that at all. Instead, she goes to Naaman's wife and she says, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. I'm convinced of it. Urge him to go. You know, despite all that's happened to her, this young girl has not lost her faith in God. She does not harbour any hatred or ill feeling towards her captors. And she believes in a God who heals, a God who forgives, who changes lives. You know, she could easily have said to herself, this is what happens to those who, dis who dishonour God, who treat his people harshly. And why should I care? It's not as if I've done anything to bring this about. Um, you know, this is God's doing and I'm just keeping quiet. Why should I speak of a cure? And who am I anyway that anyone would listen to me? People generally don't lose much sleep over the misfortunes of their enemies. I don't think Joe Biden is particularly looking to advise Donald Trump on restoring his reputation at the moment, for example. But this young slave girl, her heart is full of love and courage and compassion. And she goes to her mistress and she shares her belief that Naaman can indeed be healed, that he can receive his life back, that his reputation can be restored. And this girl is not expecting anything for herself. She's not doing this for a reward. She has no expectation of being taken back to her homeland, no expectation of being reunited with her family, no expectation of being able to kneel down and worship her God in her own place. She is simply wanting Naaman to receive a blessing from her God. You know, I'm reminded of Jesus's words, do to others as you would have them do for you. This girl wants the very best for her master and she doesn't look to her own interests. She seeks God's blessing on this pagan soldier before thinking of God's blessing upon herself. And the fact that she is in captivity doesn't weaken her faith in God or her resolve to honour his name wherever she may be. Well, we know the story, don't we? Naaman accepts her words and indeed he goes to Samaria. You know, he takes the word of this slave girl as his hope. And interestingly, the king of Samaria, sitting on his throne, doesn't seem to share the faith of this young girl. You know, he's got everything around him. She has nothing. And so it's Elisha who calls Naaman and tells him to wash himself in the Jordan seven times and he will be cleansed. Eventually, after much protestation, he does so and he is cured. And he returns to Elisha and says, Now I know there is no God in all the world except the God of Israel. You know, Naaman's whole life has been transformed by one simple sentence uttered with love and courage and faith from a young slave girl in captivity. All she wanted to do was to see her master blessed. And I can just imagine him walking through the door a few weeks later and she sees him there cleansed and she sees her mistress hugging her husband and she sees that God has indeed answered her prayers. And I can see her tears 
welling up in her eyes and her heart bursting with joy. Because God has answered her and because the life of her new family has been transformed. And she's not thinking, oh, if only it could have been me. She's just delighting in seeing the grace of God come into the lives of these people. And we're going to be thinking a little bit more about that in a few moments. But first, I want us to just to sing a song which just echoes that that longing, that that hunger for God and to have him draw near. And may we use that as a prayer for God to draw near to us now.
For this slave girl, Naaman's household was her front line. It wasn't the place that she would have chosen to be, but it was the place that God called her to be, to witness to her faith and to demonstrate his love. It wasn't a place of confidence for her. It was hard work. Um, she had little status and none of those around her shared her faith. It was a difficult working environment. And yet she changed the course of her family's life. And her actions have been recorded forever in this account. We may not know her name, but God knows who she is and he loves her for it. And when we do things of loving kindness, demonstrating his, his love for his people, we may not have our name recognised here on earth, but nothing happens that our God does not see and our God does not delight in. And he will remember us. And so I want us to think about our front lines, the places where God has called us to show his love. And our front lines can be as diverse as we are ourselves. They can be based around our workplace, uh, our leisure pursuits, our social gatherings, our common interest groups, uh, even our homes. And we may feel very confident about sharing our faith on these front lines. Or we may feel very much like a duck out of water. We may think to ourselves, nobody wants to know about what I, what I believe on my front line. It's irrelevant to those around, uh, around me. They're, they're not interested. It never comes up. But consider this young slave girl in Naaman's household. She must have lived well on her front line, mustn't she? Because when she went to her mistress to speak about the possibility of a cure, it would have been so easy for her mistress to ignore her, pretend that she hadn't heard. You know, these are just the, the musings of an insignificant slave girl pining for her homeland. Of course she would say there's a healer in her own country. But can he really be better than all our healers? How can I go to my husband and speak of this, this miracle worker? What was he going to say? You know, remember Naaman's words. Are not all the rivers of Aparna and Partha better than any of the waters in Israel? You know, they're a defeated people. They're insignificant, they're despised. Why should we listen to this girl? But you know, Naaman's wife saw something in this girl. Her life amongst them spoke of integrity, of diligence and dignity. Her character and her concern caused her words to be heard. Her life backed up her testimony. Naaman's wife could see that she spoke with authenticity, with understanding and compassion. She knew exactly what her husband was going through, what she was going through. And she wasn't offering trite explanations or comments. She was genuinely seeking to give help heart to heart and that made all the difference and that's what made this woman go to her husband and say you've got to listen to this girl and that's what made Naaman go to the king and say you've got to take notice of what this girl said to me and that's what made the king write the letter and send Naaman on his way How do others perceive us on our front lines? Do our lives give notice to our words? Do we walk the talk? 
Do we share the lives of those around us? Do we journey with them? Do we put their interests before our own? Do we seek their blessing, even when it may not help us? Is our passion to bring about God's loving purposes, God's work of reconciliation, God bringing his kingdom in on our front lines? You know, we may think we cannot change the world, but by God's grace, we can make our part of the world, our front lines, reflect more of his glory, show more of his love. A simple act of kindness, a single word of encouragement, uh, a silent step alongside someone, a stand against injustice can bring about change. At his inauguration, Joe Biden spoke on unity each of us can start a ripple of change. And we might say, well, that's not very much. A ripple, it only lasts a moment. But if those ripples come together, they can create a powerful tide. And that tide can break rocks and shape continents. And so too, our simple actions our simple words, in concert, under God's direction, can break down barriers and shape lives. Bringing about the kingdom of God here, in this place, to his glory. Over Lent, we will be running a course entitled Fruitfulness on the Front Line. It's a book written by Mark Green, and we'll be looking at our front lines and about how we can make a difference where we are. And, you know, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on our relationships. Over the past few months, I've come to recognise more clearly than ever before the importance of every encounter, every moment that we spend with another person. How are we using that time to communicate loving concern, to inspire hope and joy, to bring in God's kingdom? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this young girl, this girl without a name, who transformed the life of Naaman. And Lord, we pray that we might be like her, that you might give us the words to say, that you might move our hearts, that you might use our hands to touch the lives of those around us, to bring in your kingdom. For we ask these things for your glory's sake. Amen. Howard will now lead us in prayer. Our prayers today use the hymn, Lord of all hopefulness, for our theme. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy, in his trust ever childlike, no cares could destroy. Be there at our waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the day. Heavenly Father, please help us as we awake each day to be aware of your presence with us and commit ourselves to serve wherever you lead us, confident of your spirit within us. Please calm our anxieties about COVID-19, facing each day to keep ourselves and others safe and looking forward to better days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord of all eagerness, Lord of all faith, whose strong hands were skilled at the plane on the lathe. Be there at our labours and give us, we pray, your strength in our hearts, Lord, at the noon of the day. Please help us, Lord, in all the things we do, to be ever mindful of your presence and to be your hands on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all kindness, Lord of all grace, your hands swift to welcome, your arms to embrace. Be there at our homing and give us, we pray, your love in our hearts, Lord, at the eve of the day. Lord, we know that without your presence, we are nothing. Please help us to strive each day against the hazards of life that so easily divert us into ways that are unworthy of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice is contentment, whose presence is balm. Be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of the day. As we come to you, you in our homes this day, let it be a place of peace. We think of those who are in our hearts, those who are sad or suffering, worried, sick or lonely. And in bereavement, remember the family and friends of those who have died, those known to us. Please give all of those who mourn the assurance of your presence and the hope of eternal joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. So we draw our prayers to a close with the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We'll now sing our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory.
give him the glory. Great things he hath done in our lives and in his world. And so we come to our blessing. May the Father who has loved the eternal Son from before the foundation of the world shed that love upon you, his children. Amen. Amen. And may Christ, who by his incarnation gathered into one all things earthly and heavenly, fill you with joy and peace. Amen. Amen. And may the Holy Spirit, by whose overshadowing Mary became the God-bearer, give you grace to carry the good news of Christ. Amen. Amen. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you and those you love and pray for this day and for evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.